Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kevin Clements, the director of the Toyota Peace Institute, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the latest public conversation in our thematic series on climate change and conflict in Oceania. We're very privileged today to welcome the Honorable Ralph Brigham to our conversation. Ralph's that rare politician who combines principle with pragmatism and is willing to make personal and political sacrifices to advance his own deeply held values. He has an artist's sensibility and indeed, among many other items and talents, is a renowned painter and illustrator. His early career was in anthropology and it was as the director of the Vanuatu National Cultural Center that I first met him. I was impressed with him then and continue to be impressed now with his dedication to cultural knowledge preservation and a strong desire to work out how Vanuatu can build on customary traditions to create locally grounded post-colonial identities for the 21st century. He entered politics in 2008 and as a member of parliament has worked for open government and citizen inclusion and decision making. He was Vanuatu's Minister of Lands and National Re Natural Resources in June 2014 with a particular concern for the social impacts of deep sea mining and he's maintained this concern to the present. He was Vanuatu's Minister for Foreign Affairs from 2017 to 2019 and is now leader of the opposition. Ralph, it's a great privilege to welcome you to this public conversation. And I also want to introduce you to my co-interviewer, Dr. Volker Berge, a senior research fellow in charge of climate change and conflict. So Ralph, welcome. So in terms of the first question, before we move on to substantive issues, I wonder if you could give us some of your personal history and how your parental influences, university work, and leadership of the National Cultural Center have shaped the issues you're concerned about. Well, thank you um, for having me. So it's an honor to be uh, interviewed by uh, this uh, prestigious uh, magazine and organization. Um, yes, well, I, I am the son of uh, independence activists. So both my father and my mother were involved in the independence struggle of Vanuatu when, we, when it was the New Hebrides. Uh, uh -huh. When I was growing up in Port Vila, uh, sort of exposed to all that activism that was happening at the time. Um, my father eventually became one of the first ministers in the Waltolini, the first Waltolini led government in 1980 on independence. And so immediately after that also, I was able to observe the workings of a, of a, of a new nation. As a, as a student, I was, I, was, I was in high school by the early 80s. Uh, and then uh, just an interest in development and how the country is progressing and how we were trying to use our cultural roots to overcome a legacy of colonialism and create a sort of a new nation state led me to you know, be interested in studying anthropology and development studies. And that's what I ended up getting degrees in. And uh, I went straight from there into cultural heritage management, which was my interest and passion. And then also, that's when I came to sort of observe much more the, the contradictions that existed between the state and the stated policies of promoting culture and tradition and how that was problematic in the context of, you know, Western style state uh, interested in capitalist development. And so that's kind of informed uh, how I've been trying to intervene in the area of politics to sort of uh, shore up uh, some of the uh, guiding principles that founded the nation, which was uh, as a much more sort of indigenous values informed uh, interaction with the international order and trying to, I suppose, tame the state, uh, sort of uh, draw it back from some of the more extractive or uh, you know, uh, dictatorial tendencies and seeing if we could really sort of man man continue to manifest uh, Vanuatu as a, as a democracy in the real sense uh, and, and pay much more attention to where we've come from as uh, something that sets up ourselves up to be able to face the world in a, in a quite unique way, which is where Vanuatu has come from. Mm -hmm. no, so I suppose that's, what I, that's my, my personal influences are. Well, that's wonderful. So you're you, you're a direct link back to Walter Lini and the um, all the other leaders at the beginning, right? Fantastic. Um, 
Both of you want to continue with the next question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ralph. It's great uh, to have you with us this, this afternoon. And I like your phrase, taming the state. <laughs> it's, it's very close to, to my heart and what I'm interested in as, as well, uh, coming from a peace and conflict studies background. And today, uh, we would like, Kevin already mentioned it, that you now have launched this Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance on deep sea mining in the context of the our ocean conference in Palau in, uh, in April this year. And so uh, we would like to talk uh, a bit more in detail about uh, your criticism of deep sea mining in this interview, at least in the first part. And so maybe you can start and um, can tell us what this new alliance is about and uh, who are, are the members of, of this alliance. Uh, as, as you know, uh, deep sea mining was first it first appeared in the Pacific, in Papua New Guinea, when uh, a company uh, called Nautilus uh, obtained the first license ever issued to prospect and mine the deep seabed. And that whole venture ended, well, it ended, it, it ended well for the people of Papua New Guinea in that nothing happened, but it ended very badly in that the state lost, lost a lot of money in this company. Nothing happened in terms of any mining. But uh, it was a very, very failed venture on, on behalf of the, the Papua New Guinea state. And I think since then, the, uh, the uh, prime minister or the caretaker prime minister at the moment, since they're going through elections, uh, the Honorable Marape, has indicated their interest in a moratorium on, on deep sea mining based on that experience. But back in uh, 2021, the latest iteration of uh, deep sea mining in the Pacific uh, emerged, which was that. Nauru, uh, which is a sovereign nation state, a member of the Pacific Island Forum, um, made an application to the International Seabed Authority, the ISA, which is the regulator for activities to do with uh, mining in the seabed. Nauru made an application a couple of years ago that it would want to proceed with deep sea mining in its uh, EEZ. And this triggered a mechanism in the ISA whereby they have to be allowed to uh, proceed with mining, regardless of whether the ISA comes up with um, rules or laws to govern uh, this, new, this new activity in the, uh, in the ocean, which is deep sea mining. So even in the absence of any um, internationally, multilaterally agreed uh, laws to govern and regulate deep sea mining, if the ISA can't come up with them by July next year, 2023, Nauru can proceed deep sea mining. And that was that trigger in the ISA was what led many of us in the region to be suddenly faced with the reality that in, uh, you know, in just over a year from now, we could have deep sea mining happening in the in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and all the unknowns around that all the possibilities of transboundary harm, um, dis destruction of the, you know, the marine environment, uh, the lack of scientific knowledge of what, what's down there, what, what will be the impacts, uh, the absence of any environmental baseline of the Pacific Ocean. So those worries, uh, fears uh, have led to a lot of talking in the region, uh, numerous meetings. And um, finally, last year, uh, we agreed that we need, to, we need to work as a region. And that was very important for us because in the past, historically, the Pacific has always emerged much stronger when it works as a region. And that is in fact, the origins of Pacific regionalism. That when, when we work as a region, we can be a very powerful uh, influencing factor on the international um, order. And a good example is, um, you know, 1.5 degrees as the target from the climate change negotiations was acknowledged to come out of the Pacific. Uh, we do have, for example, the Rarotonga Treaty, Nuclear Free Independent Pacific, uh, initiated in the Pacific Islands. So regionalism uh, is the approach that works for the Pacific, and we need to adopt this approach when it comes to deep sea mining. And we were very concerned that this wasn't happening with deep sea mining, that in fact, Nauru was going ahead. Uh, it's, it's, it's issued this application to trigger 
the ISA to have to do something. Uh, Cook Islands is also well ahead in uh, pursuing, uh, trying to get the companies interested in uh, deep sea mining in its territory. Tuvalu, Tonga have been talking about it. And so parliamentarians from around the region who shared this concern decided that we need to move across all legislatures to make sure this, this issue is addressed across all legislatures that all the states sort of agree that we need to take a regional approach where we all sort of come to the table and discuss it together rather than going off as we are at the moment. And so we launched um, in April, I was appointed the chair just before that by my colleagues and, and my colleagues are parliamentarians uh, and senators from throughout the Pacific, including from all the Melanesian countries, Vanuatu, Solomons, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, uh, New Caledonia, Kanaki has members, also uh, Tuvalu, uh, New Zealand. We have members from French Polynesia, from Guam, Hawaii, the autonomous region of Bougainville. And uh, we're always uh, adding members. We, uh, we have a member now from Samoa and uh, we will continue to in try and enhance our membership. And we're also reaching out to legislators in the countries where uh, the interest has been expressed in, in deep sea mining. Now that's that's uh, would be my next question. Have you engaged with your colleagues from Nauru and, and uh, Cook Islands on this issue? Are there conversations going on? And what's their response to your criticism so far? We have been attempting to reach out to Nauru, um, and that hasn't been successful to date. Um, we requested to meet with, with them. Uh, we have... Uh, We've had a bit of pushback from the Cook Islands. Um, with Tuvalu, Tuvalu was one of the countries that had applied for, uh, had issued a license for deep sea mining. And as a result of our approaches, they actually withdrew that application and have agreed to join this alliance. So that was a great success for us to see one of the four countries expressing interest having withdrawn as a result of uh, uh, their own internal proceedings, but also we were able to push them along for that. Um, and so we hope that the, the upcoming forum next month or, or in July, as well as the United Nations Ocean Summit will be other opportunities to engage in these bilaterals that we're seeking to have. But so far, yeah, uh, Tuvalu has uh, withdrawn, written to the ISA withdrawing its uh, approval for uh, an, app, an application to proceed on in, in its territory, and we're hoping that the others would be the same. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, in terms of your own country, uh, um, Ralph uh, Vanuatu, I mean, have you got embedded in your own um, domestic legislation and so forth, uh, opposition to deep sea mining, and uh, is there a sort of national unity around that issue? Um, not not uh, on paper. Uh, we have been, I initiated the process of talking about this issue and consulting about this issue back when I was the minister responsible for mines uh, back in 2014. And in fact, that process of doing a review of our national mining policies uh, with a view to amending um, the Mines and Minerals Act, which is basically a colonial act that we've carried over into, into our new uh, nation. As part of that review, there was, there has been a national wide consultation going on. And that consultation only in fact ended at the end of last year. Um, and at the end of last year, it, it was very clear then as well that um, deep sea mining was not wanted by the population of the country. We had uh, all the peak civil society groups, for example, the Vanuatu Council of Churches representing all the churches, the National Council of Chiefs representing chiefs, the National Council of Women representing women, National Council of Youth representing youth, the Vanuatu Association of Ungovernment Organizations representing NGOs, all very explicitly saying we do not want deep sea mining included in uh, any uh, future development of, of Vanuatu. Nevertheless, the Mines and Minerals Policy, the new one was uh, just approved at the beginning of this year, and it includes a provision for deep sea mining. I mean, it's, it's couched in very precautionary terms, 
saying it's an option that could be considered with all this kind of thing, but it wasn't exactly what the people are asking for, which is that it was taken completely off the menu. So it is still there as an option, but um, whether it can proceed or not, anything can be done is another question because of such widespread opposition. So this means more work uh, for you to do also in your home home country. Uh, but coming back to the Our Oceans uh, Conference, uh, there you also presented this uh, Our Ocean Call Statement. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on the core elements of this Our Ocean Call? So the Our Ocean Call was uh, the founding statement of um, the Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance and DSM, uh, which was read out as part of the launch by myself. And basically we were making the point that uh, as leaders in the Pacific uh, and legislators are elected leaders in the Pacific um, and custodians of our ocean, there we do have an obligation to preserve the ocean for the sake of future generations or living and non-living things. And that there is a moral aspect to this uh, mandate we have to protect our ocean, which in many of our um, cosmologies is sacred. So we were calling on recognition by all leaders that the ocean is our common heritage. And this echoes some of the wording from United Nations instruments, like the law of the sea and the founding document of the International Seabed Authority. We have a common responsibility and moral obligation for its protection. And we were calling upon leaders to not only recognize that, but also to join the growing numbers of organizations and governments and scientific authorities who are saying that we should not rush to mine the ocean floor as is happening now, a sort of a free for all rush unregulated by any uh, common uh, foundational kind of rules or obligations. And uh, we asked all leaders to join, you know, what, what the IUCN said just recently last year, uh, the, you know, one of the peak uh, international scientific bodies that we should ban seabed mining, um, that m many governments have, uh, have stated. And we also support the call by the Pacific governments who have said this, for example, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, that we need to suspend deep sea mining activities uh, in terms of a moratorium for at least you know, 10 years, maybe until the end of the decade of ocean science, which is 2030, so that we can build up a greater scientific understanding about the potential impacts of DSM before we collectively take a decision as to how to proceed with this opportunity or threat and also support the growing call for a moratorium. As I said, in line with the UN Decade of Ocean Science Sustainable Development, which is, we're currently in it. And uh, urge all states in accordance with precautionary principle and in support of evidence-based policymaking to adopt an approach that relies on, you know, scientific data, scientific evidence uh, to determine whether we should proceed and in particular, you know, calling on the Pacific states that have already embarked down this path to stop, reconsider, and join the rest of us in trying to make some decisions about where we should go. Gosh, your work in this area is wonderful, Ralph, and it's, um, it's, it's really an example to the rest of the region. Uh, can you give us some indication about, you know, Pacific people's understanding of and connection to the sea and the ocean? and its sort of cultural and spiritual dimensions, because your concern for deep sea mining is um, part, I suspect, of a much larger concern uh, about the kind of nature of the relationship between the cultural relationship uh, between the sea and the people. Uh, and I think it would be very helpful for non-Oceanian um, viewers of this program to sort of some, to understand something about the cultural and spiritual dimensions of the sea for, for you and Vanuatu and for your colleagues in other countries in the region? Well, the, the Pacific Island States is a, is a region where indigenous people make up most of the people in the States. For example, in Vanuatu, 
over 90% of our population are indigenous people, uh, which means the first people of the land who were here and originated from came out of the land and the sea. And, and this is our place. Uh, we didn't come here from somewhere, according to our own, our own spirituality and our own mythology. Um, so the Pacific is a, is, a, is a territory with a very high level of indigeneity of the, of the populations. Um, very strong connections with our traditions that comes from uh, that fact. Uh, and of course, we've lived in, in the Pacific for millennia. And it's central to our well being, you know, before uh, so called Western development, uh, everything uh, came from the environment. Uh, our identity, our existence, our spirituality comes from the land and the seas. We have our origin stories in the land and the sea of our islands, um, our history, our ancestors are here in the land and they're, you know, they're buried here and they, they're still with us in, in the way we relate to uh, each other in our you know, extended kin groups and so on. So in our traditions, caring for the ocean and for the land is a responsibility that is part of uh, our, our cultural traditions as well, what we call traditional resource management. It's what's sustained ocean ecologies for this long. And uh, this has been going on for generations. And so there is a very strong cultural and spiritual dimension to this connection that Pacific Islanders have with the ocean. And it's something we're trying to appeal to, uh, to build solidarity behind uh, this move to uh, put the brakes on uh, rushing towards um, mining the seabed at this particular time in our in our history Great. yeah I, I think it's very important to bring this message across to people from a so-called uh, secular western uh, background and so my question would be uh, what are your plans to uh, also influence the international debate so what are the next steps for your alliance in this regard. I think you mentioned that you're planning to go to, to Lisbon any, sometime soon. Yes, um, we, are, we, we have got a, a side event approved at the uh, United Nations Ocean Conference in Lisbon at the end of June. And so that is a side event being co-hosted by the government of Tuvalu, um, the, the, this Pacific Parliamentarians Alliance and DAWN, the Feminist Collective. And we have uh, some very distinguished speakers uh, tentatively uh, organized to be on that panel. And that is also where we are trying to go and meet up with like-minded parliamentarians from, from other countries in the world. There is a large network called the uh, Parliamentarians of Global Action. And they have also issued a statement calling for uh, a moratorium on deep sea mining and a particular angle, which is something we've we are, we are going to join with them in doing, which is looking at reform of the International Seabed Authority, which we see is not really making decisions on behalf of uh, uh, an approach to protection of our common heritage. It's more, uh, they more seem to be more supportive of uh, extractive approach. Mm -hmm. So we are meeting with, we are already arranging meetings now with uh, parliamentarians from many other countries who are members of the parliamentarians for global action, working towards uh, perhaps having a resolution at the next ISA meeting, which will be in August at the headquarters of the ISA in, in Jamaica. Um, that is an action that PJ has agreed on, we have agreed on as well. And so we will, we will work working together to see if we can join forces so as many nations as possible can bring that forward. And also, of course, um, on, on a bilateral level, we'll be trying to talk to as many other leaders as possible in the Pacific at the Pacific Islands Forum which is coming up very shortly. And particularly, you know, the leaders of uh, the countries that are already, have already announced the decision to go down this road and see if we can come to some sort of agreement or compromise or some regional position, which allows us to walk this walk together as a region. Now, it's a sort of a supplementary question to that one, uh, which has to do with the current visit by the Chinese delegation to the PIF and to all the um, Pacific Island states. Do you see this overture uh, in part as an attempt to soften up um, 
uh, nations in the Pacific for some Chinese resource mining. Uh, is that, do you think that's part of the initiative? I don't think I'll comment on that. I think, you know, suffice to say that all the um, possible deep sea mining corporations are all not from the Pacific and they're all from US, Canada, UK, Europe, China. Uh -huh. And so the companies that are involved in this are from those countries, they're not from the Pacific. And I imagine those countries may be trying to push their own agendas and uh, we'll see where that goes. The, the tricky thing is that these companies now also argue that they need new uh, forms of mining to combat climate change. So uh, the mainstream uh, line of argument at the moment is, yes, we need a green transition, we need renewables, we need this energy transition, but this also means we need more mining for lithium, copper, and so forth, including deep sea mining. So how do you reconcile um, climate change policies to this uh, argument, we need more mining in order to uh, really pursue this, this green energy transition? Well, I think it's a very dangerous and ingenious argument. Uh, it is not a mainstream argument. This is the corporate argument and it's not supported at all by any science. And we see that from, uh, you know, the IUCN coming out and calling for a moratorium on, uh, on any seabed mining. It misses, or it, 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 it emits the point that uh, the, the ocean is our greatest carbon sink. Um, the services of the ocean as a climate regulator, capturing and storing carbon dioxide, methane, is, one of the most important climate regulation functions of any, any ecosystem on the earth. It's, it's the most important carbon sink we have. Yeah. And there's no scenario where DSM does not disturb this function. There's no scenario where DSM does not cause biodiversity loss. There's no scenario where DSM does not cause ecosystem damage. And so given that we know so little about uh, the functions of the ocean as a, as, a, as a carbon sink and how it regulates the climate. Um, we, we know so little about the ecosystems. Given that um, DSM will be happening for the first time wherever it happens in the Pacific, and so by definition it's experimental. Um, it's impossible to uphold a precautionary principle when you're doing something like that. We, they have to be, we have to expect uh, errors I think, uh, and, and in the, you know, in, in light of emerging technologies and in light of, you know, the calls to recycle minerals as, as a much better approach to obtaining the minerals we need for any possible uh, use in, 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 in a transition. Um, to even talk about deep sea mining, I think is just a very, very dangerous talk. And I think any argument that says we need to do it to, uh, address climate change is just totally fallacious. It's a very good argument. I'm going to use that argument <laughs> in the future. It's, 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 it's great. Two weeks ago, Vanuatu was sort of hit by Cyclone Gina, uh, and cyclones seem to be becoming more frequent and intense in your region, and indeed as they are in um, New Zealand and, um, and, and Australia as well. Is Vanuatu being affected by other um, effects of climate change like sea level rise and saltwater intrusion and um, what's the impact on sort of low-lying atolls in, in, in your own country, droughts and floods? I mean, do you see that climate change is having a direct impact on your well-being and on your ability to really prepare for the future in terms of, um, you know, helping the uh, people of Vanuatu um, kind of increase their resilience? to such uh, events. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, you mentioned Cyclone Gina, so that was uh, out of season cyclone. So our, our cyclone season had officially finished. And every few years, every five years or so, the cyclone season gets, gets extended. So I see a scenario in the not too distant future where we will be having cyclones all year round. Mm. Uh, Gina was in May, right? So our cyclone season officially ended in at the end of April. 
And that was a change from some years ago when it ended at the end of March. Mm. So we are experiencing more frequent and, more, and stronger cyclones. Uh, we are now cut every five quite regularly every couple, every couple of years uh, since 2015. Um, one, one thing we're noticing is, is a real impact of climate change is much more intense rain bursts with flash flooding events. Uh, flooding and much more intensive rain, rain uh, hazards is something that is really affecting um, people's lives on a daily basis because people are living in these areas that are being affected, previously never been affected by any sort of flooding or so on, and suddenly they're being affected uh, for the first time ever in living memory. Uh, of course, sea level rise, saltwater intrusion is happening everywhere. We are lucky in Vanuatu because uh, we are high islands. We're mostly mountainous. We only have one atoll in the whole archipelago. Um, so, but all the low-lying areas, um, they're all experiencing sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, flooding. And uh, even though we are lucky to say we're, we're high islands, all the high areas as well are experiencing uh, the effects of intense rain bursts landslides. We're getting um, biodiversity loss, of course, which is um, dovetailing with the human-induced habitat destruction. Mm. So we're getting accelerated biodiversity loss, which affects also, um, you know, the, the, the crops we plant to eat, considering that most of, uh, you know, Nivanuatu uh, people depend on uh, food gardening for at least part of their uh, diet if not most of it, um, this is also a big impact. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, what I'm seeing just from the last few years or maybe the last 10 years is that uh, we're going to be expecting a lot more issues with, uh, with flooding, uh, intense rainfall, uh, affecting where we can live, how we can live, and it particularly affecting infrastructure. Mm. It's very hard to have good infrastructure when it's always being washed away or damaged by rain and so on. So mm -hmm. this is part of the argument we have for much more climate finance to fund sustainable infrastructure that can be built and, and lasts, as opposed to a lot of what we're seeing now, which is um, roads being washed away year after year, yeah. um, buildings being you know, torn down year after year. We need to be thinking much more in terms of spending more money on much more um, durable, permanent infrastructure. Okay. And are people already forced to relocate in Vanuatu because of the effects of climate change? So the government of Vanuatu in 2018 has passed this national policy on climate change and disaster and use displacement. And Fiji has something similar with their displacement guidelines and planned relocation guidelines. So Fiji and Vanuatu, as I understand it, are at the forefront of thinking about uh, climate change induced uh, relocation, displacement, evacuation, um, migration. So what are the experiences with this national policy so far? And what do you think has to, has to be done at the, that front? Well, we were, we were uh, one of the first to have such a policy. And um, as you said, in 2018, we launched this, this policy on disaster-induced displacement. Um, it was largely provoked by the um, eruption of a volcano on the island of Ambai, where the whole island had to be evacuated, uh, which is, uh, I guess, never happened before in, in Vanuatu. We've had parts of islands evacuated. But I think the policy itself is, has not been you know, uh, properly implemented yet. It's, uh, it, is a, it is a plan, and it's good we have it as a policy as a, a, to guide us. Uh, I think we haven't actually um, properly implemented uh, any of this uh, disaster-induced displacement, mainly because uh, on the one hand, uh, we have been doing this forever, like uh, uh, in our Vanuatu since forever, 
we've always had um, tr tr traditions and connections for uh, looking after people who are displaced temporarily by um, a volcanic eruption, uh, a cyclone, floods, this kind of thing. Um, and that is, a, that is a proud tradition, I would say, that we have in our country. And we have people who, you know, generations ago moved and have, are still living in other areas. And this is uh, before there was an effective state. So now that is still happening. That is still happening without much state involvement. Uh, this policy uh, posits a much greater role for the state. And it's, uh, I think it's a lot more complicated because what, when, the, when the state gets involved, it's, it has to be much more about finding land on which you can resettle people from other areas. Mm. And the state has, has very little experience of that. Um, there have been a number, of, maybe two or three or a handful of cases where this has happened in, in colonial times. Um, more recently, it, it has happened, you know, maybe since independence uh, a couple of times. What we're seeing is people moving more we, with the involvement of the state now that it's uh, you know, a feature of, of uh, national life, but also much more based on the traditional kind of ways or pathways for uh, dealing with uh, um, displacement caused by disasters. But of course now, and, and it's, it's a reflection of the fact that we've now got this policy, it's becoming much, much more common and much, much more needed. And I think the traditional, cope, the traditional mechanisms uh, can no longer cope with Mm -hmm. not only the scale of it, but also the, the loss of a lot of that knowledge and understanding of how to deal with that traditionally. And so we are right at the brink, I, I would say now, of the state having to step in in a big way to try and deal with particularly um, a lot of the peri-urban areas around the Vanuatu capital, Port Vila, and our second town, Luganville, which are now becoming very disaster prone, especially flood uh, prone areas with lots of people living in them. Um, we're, we're noticing now that we, ha we have less and less areas that we thought we could live on. <coughs> now we have not so many, those areas we thought we could live on, we can't live on them anymore. We're, we're seeing that now. And so, <coughs> excuse me, the state will have to step in much more to provide those land areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the informal settlements in, in Port Vila and Luganville. Can you already say uh, that these people who move into these informal settlements come there also because of the effects of climate change? Or what are the, the push and pull factors here? More and more climate change is involved. Um, historically, it's been much more the uh, very stereotypical rural urban migration, uh, looking for opportunities, jobs, that kind of thing. Um, so it, that, that is very much still happening. Uh, however, um, we are also seeing a lot more people displaced now by climate change. And also, of course, volcanic eruptions. Um, as I mentioned previously, one of the biggest relocations we have, we've experienced recently was uh, in 2018, when we had to relocate the entire population of Ambai. Yeah. And so I would say maybe half of those people have moved back, but the rest of them are in Santo mm -hmm. uh, and in Villa. Mm -hmm. And so they've been almost permanently re relocated because of that, that uh, disaster that happened, a natural disaster, that volcanic eruption. Um, but also um, when we see cyclones hitting like uh, TC Harold, more people need to move to just to temporarily recover from um, the cyclone. And then whether they move back or not, uh, I think there's, I, th I think they all don't move back. And so we're seeing much more climate, uh, climate change factors in uh, rural urban migration these days as well. Is this resulting in any increased conflict in, in Vila and other places where, you know, those who've been forced to relocate because of natural disasters like volcanoes or cyclones and so forth are, are forced to settle. Um, are you finding that there's been an increase in actual direct conflict as a result? Um, or uh, conflicts about you know, insecure land tenure arrangements or even conflicts around um, 
those that are already living on the land being worried about their own displacement. Yes, I mean, all those forms of conflict we're seeing, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a testimony to the strength of our traditional culture and economy that uh, traditional economy that we're not seeing more of those conflicts. I mean, most, a lot of them are, you know, uh, are, are managed within the uh, traditional arrangements by traditional leaders and uh, negotiations and so on, customary ways of dealing with it. A lot of people, uh, the majority of people living in the peri-urban areas around the capital city of Portville and Luganville are living on customary land under customary arrangements with uh, traditional landowners. Um, what we're seeing is uh, customary, what we're seeing more, more as a cause of conflict is customary owners of land deciding that they do not want uh, these people living on their land, even though perhaps their fathers or their grandfathers had agreed to it and there was a uh, customary arrangement made then, we're seeing the next generation, for example, not respecting that customary arrangement and starting to talk about wanting money for their land. Mm. And that causes evictions. Recently, uh, the more, more recent evictions have been more toward, to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, but as we see people move into all areas of uh, as moving away from where they used to live, um, we're seeing more of these arrangements have to be entered into. And that's why I'm, I'm talking about the, the inevitable need for the state to become involved because the principal need of these um, informal settlements and the settlers in them are the migrants, you could say. The principal need is for security of tenure. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if that can be obtained, uh, the rest is it follows on having you know, proper housing, proper sanitation, it all follows on from the security of tenure. Mm -hmm. And so that's the place where uh, we need to focus a lot more attention. And it's made complicated because our constitution places almost all land under customary tenure and the control of customary owners. And so there's a need to explore innovative forms of land security that can um, provide such security uh, intergenerationally in a context of rapid cultural change because mm -hmm. previously, you know, these arrangements would have lasted for generations, but these days because of uh, increased you know, westernization, monetization, um, arrangements made one generation ago will no longer be respected in the next generation, mm. um, particularly around the urban areas where westernization is more advanced. In and outer islands, it will, it'll, it'll be that it'll be just absorbed into that traditional system. And so this is one of the things we need to promote more, much more is this uh, promotion of the traditional system of um, providing land to, to uh, migrants from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier the need also for more financial assistance when it comes to adaptation measures, in, uh, strengthening of the infrastructure and so forth. So what are your expectations uh, with regard to what the big brothers, so to speak, of the Pacific Island countries could do, Australia and New Zealand, to support Vanuatu and other Pacific Island countries in their efforts to adapt to climate change or also in their efforts when it comes to a ban or a moratorium on deep sea mining. So uh, what are your expectations there? And do you also are in discussions with um, colleagues from New Zealand? On We have to remember that uh, the Northern Territory in Australia is, is one of the first jurisdictions to ban deep sea mining. Um, New Zealand courts have also ruled against deep sea mining. So Australia and New Zealand are already in a way taking some leadership on deep sea mining. And we would hope that they would um, see uh, the obvious need for a uh, precautionary approach, a moratorium until we regionally can move at the level of the Pacific Islands Forum, of which they are members, also the ISA and the United Nations. Um, in terms of uh, climate, we, we, we welcome you know, the new Australian government's uh, much improved position in recognizing climate change and uh, the implications of that. 
And of course, as I mentioned earlier in my, in my discussion, um, there is a, a growing need for financing of adaptation, particularly around infrastructure. Uh, and, it, and it's costly, like durable, sustainable infrastructure that can withstand um, cyclones and floods and so on is, is expensive. And it's something that's quite outside our national budget's capacity. And um, we, you know, in line with the, the Paris Agreement, uh, Vanuatu, along with all the Pacific Island states, is expecting much more um, climate finance of the levels we, we agreed upon in Paris and subsequently recognition of the importance of loss and damage and commitment to um, uh, financial arrangements to deal with loss and damage, which is uh, now what we're facing. And we just hope that all of this uh, financing will be stepped up. Um, we're seeing also, I think in Australia, New Zealand, uh, pathways for uh, labor, labor mobility, but also labor migration which uh, has been much more utilized by Polynesian countries up to date. It's becoming available now to uh, Melanesian countries. But I think the, the climate financing and working as part of the, the Pacific Islands Forum as a regional bloc on issues like climate change, and also, of course, deep sea mining is what we would expect uh, our bigger, more developed members, Australia, New Zealand to, to do. Mm -hmm. Um, your, your governments are pursuing an initiative right now to uh, re request an advisory opinion from the ICJ on human rights and climate change, sort of arguing that under international law, states will have an obligation to protect the rights of present and future generations in the face of the effects of climate change. Uh, and it's also coupled with the UNGA resolution in September. I mean, do you as the leader of the opposition see this as a good move and do you support the initiative and what do you think its prospects are? Yes, I do support the initiative. In fact, uh, uh, I was one of those who initiated it in the last government. Okay. Um, and so it is now underway. And uh, it goes back to what I just said about the our frustration with the level of climate finance now being made available. It's basically our frustration with that level of climate, climate finance and how it's been made available to us, despite what we agreed to uh, back in Paris that has led us to uh, request or seek to request this advisory opinion so that there is more imperative mm -hmm. to require such payments uh, as an obligation uh, from those who perhaps caused the harm that we are now experiencing the effects of. So yes, I, I'm, I'm very supportive of it and uh, a, lot, a lot will depend on whether we get the support of the Pacific Islands Forum at, the, at its upcoming meeting. Um, we have already got the support of CARICOM, the Caribbean equivalent of the Pacific Islands Forum has already endorsed the resolution. Good. Uh, we're doing a lot of lobbying around all forums at the moment, um, but I think the Pacific Islands Forum will be a key one once the Pacific Island Forum fully endorses the initiative. And um, I was the Minister of Foreign Affairs when I first raised this at the forum in 2018, and at, and at that stage the forum was willing to note it as an initiative Vanuatu was taking. And now, since then, we have developed it uh, with the help of uh, international lawyers. And we're at the stage now where we, we feel that uh, we do have uh, the question, which is the very crucial aspect, that the particular question we want the opinion on. Um, and we have the, we've done the groundwork with other countries. Mm -hmm. I think once the PIF approves it, then it will be, it'll have a lot of chance to get through with the UNGA in September, which is what you need for them to go to the ICJ. Right, right. That's, that's excellent. All, all the best for, for your work on, on this. Maybe as a final question from, from our, our side, uh, coming from a peace, um, a peace Research Institute, of course, we are interested in your views on the linkages between climate change and peace, conflict and security. So what do you think, what are the most pressing challenges to peace and security related to climate change in the Pacific? I think, uh, as I've been saying, one of the biggest challenges is somewhere to safe to live. Um, increasingly, 
Pacific peoples would be looking for somewhere safe to live. And um, the more that climate change impacts our region, uh, we do find that we're finding it, we're finding less and less places that are safe to live and find, trying to find somewhere that is safe to live can cause further conflicts with people who already live there or with existing arrangements, with uh, uh, interest groups that may be negatively affected by the fact that certain people need to find somewhere safe to live. And I think uh, that is the, as, as the Boy Declaration says, you know, uh, climate change is the greatest security threat in our region. And I think we need to try and stop being um, distracted by a lot of the geopolitical stuff that talks about, you know, militarization and uh, increased uh, security in terms of police forces and so on. I think we really need to start talking about um, funding being made available for relocation, land to be bought, infrastructure to be built, so that people have somewhere safe to live uh, as they, as the years go by and we get more and more impacted by flooding events, uh, sea level intrusion, sea level rise. Um, it's going to be, people are going to be scrambling and fighting to find somewhere safe to live. And that's what we need to focus all our development efforts on is uh, ensuring that people have somewhere safe to live. And uh, we are in a region that's, that's becoming less safe because of climate change. And so it is, a, it is the big challenge for our governments into the future. And we need to improve our own governance arrangements, you know, we, our, own, our own states in the Pacific. We have a lot of work to do in, in reform to make sure that we're more responsive to these needs as we go forward and, we, and perhaps we pay less attention to things that don't directly uh, contribute to improved uh, living and standard of living and sustainable development and durable development for our people. And, um, and by doing so also reduce the uh, possibilities for conflict to come out of uh, these kind of uh, fears for our future. And uh, I hope that uh, I hope the region can come together again. We've had uh, you know, some recent divisions in the Pacific Islands Forum that we really need to overcome because as I said previously, historically regionalism has served us very well yeah. and it will continue to serve us well in the future. And we just need to make sure we do bring the region together um, as a way to, particularly in terms of geopolitics, to in, in, engage with the geopolitical um, challenges as we try and find our way to providing a safe place to live for our people. Gosh, uh, Ralph, I, on behalf of the Toyota Peace Institute, I just want to thank you, first of all, for being um, an unusual politician in terms of being guided by very, very strong beliefs and values for your kind of radical, critical consciousness of the dynamics that undermine uh, your ability to generate safety and security for your citizens. Uh, and for all of the effort you've done so far to kind of begin anticipating major threats and challenges to custom tradition and the Vanuatu way of life uh, in uh, relation to deep sea mining uh, and in relation to uh, all the other threats that are on your agenda. Uh, you know, you, you're a, a wonderful example of a Pacific Island politician who uh, not only has his feet firmly grounded in the present, but understands very well the kind of contributions from the past in order to deal with a very kind of shaky future for all of us. And, I just want to thank you for sharing all of your opinions and views forthrightly uh, for all the great work and, and thank you again for all the great work that you're doing both nationally and regionally uh, and uh, you know you are um, sort of a living example of what a good politician should be so thanks very much. <laughs>